So I'm going to talk about it very briefly from a more academic point of view, uh, and then Kirsten's going to give some more of her experience, I think. Uh, I've also worked in this area a lot, and I'm happy to tell my tales of woe and uh, some few successes in this area. Uh, it's not easy. But when I think about it, when I lecture on this, I uh, tell students there are four ways if you're working. If you've got A, money, there are four ways you can try to influence uh, government policy. First is through a demonstration effect. So you do a project, it works really well, the government thinks, wow, that works so well, I'm going to do it myself, and they put their own money into doing this. So for each of these four, I can give you one example of success. And there I know in China, one of the big contributions of World Bank made is that when China used to uh, you know, build their roads and other infrastructure projects, you just allocate them. Like you know, civil construction uh, company number six, you go and build this road. Uh, but the World Bank came along, and the World Bank requires bidding, and not just bidding, but international competitive bidding. And so they did this, and the uh, government of China found that um, you know, these projects cost about 30 percent less than uh, their projects cost through their non-bidding method, and so they started applying bidding to all their projects. So that's kind of demonstration impact you can have uh, through an aid project. Now you're taking the risk as the donor, uh, the government really benefits. Uh, second is uh, through technical assistance. Uh, that includes policy dialogue. So here the idea is, well, look, the government doesn't, they don't really know what to do, so we'll, we'll help them do it. And a good example of that is in Indonesia, and tax evasion is a big problem. Australia has a large taxpayers unit. We focus most effort on the biggest taxpayers, as we can this return. So we pay through the aid program for some expert, tax experts you know, to go over to Indonesia and help them set up their own large taxpayer. Uh, unit and you know it, it, they got another one to percent GDP uh, as tax revenue because of that, which is a big amount. Uh, the third is uh, you know cash for reform, right? Giving money, so saying if if you make these reforms, you know we'll give you this money. And um, you know that you might have heard of structural adjustment. That's you know the, it's very controversial, but that's. Uh, the biggest example of this sort of method, right? It's, it's, it's saying, and governments often when they're in trouble, right? They come to the bank or the IMF and they say, look, we need some money. And the bank and the IMF say, well, if you do these reforms, then we'll, we'll give you the money. And actually, structural adjustment, although it's very controversial and that had a lot of costs, uh, I think was successful in uh, reorienting African policy uh, towards more open uh, uh, trade policies, towards better macroeconomic policies. And if you look at a uh, recent story of African growth, you can see you did from that. And so the final method is uh, you know, influencing civil society because you know, governments are most responsive to their own citizens. Right? It's hard to have influence as an outsider. So if you want to change government policy, then fund uh, some part of the society and get them to lobby uh, for uh, what you want. And uh, I think one successful case of that is with Australian aid and Papua New Guinea that I work uh, Australians put a lot of money into society organisations that are working against the violence against women, which is a huge problem in the country. And I think slowly that is having an effect. The cumulative effect of those voices is a sentiment. So, uh, if you're thinking about this subject, those are the four methods you can think of uh, demonstration impact, the provision of expertise, uh, in which I include networking, also dialogue, and that. Uh, and then uh, money for reforms, cash for reforms, and the fourth one is. Uh, working with civil society or, or lobby groups. And the final thing I'll say before I hand over Kirsten, you know, while I've given you some uh, success stories, there are also many failures. Uh, this is a risky area of work, and I'm very skeptical that we can measure our success in this area. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't tell a group of people that want to measure stuff, they can't measure it. <laughs> I, I'm sure we can measure success, we probably just can't attribute it. Is that better? Yeah. It gets, in, it gets the problem a little narrower. Um, okay, what I am going to say to a group of people who, who are, I guess are very focused on the evidence and making the right choices is that <coughs> most people out there are not. And um, so getting your message heard is actually the biggest challenge you will face if you want to change policy. So while I see the evidence as being critical and actually making the choice about um, what the right thing to do is, actually getting policymakers to listen has nothing to do with the science. Um, it is a tiny, tiny part of the story. And I think if you really want to be effective in changing policy, you really need to understand that. You need to work in a different way. Um, so in, in my career, um, I, 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 basically government policy has, has been an underpinning of my career for the last 25 years. I, um, I left, um, uh, my, my first sort of jobs were sort of working in... Um, 
uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union, all those countries actually trying to implement um, uh, new retirement income systems in those countries post, um, you know, you know Russia sort of falling apart. They had these massive, massive pension promises and they just couldn't afford them. So it was all working with governments to develop systems similar to the superannuation system we have in Australia. Um, you know, basically, we had a, a ready, um, you know, group of people who, who had no choice. They, there was World Bank money on the table and they had no choice but to take the advice that we were offering. Um, and looking back, I realised, you know, they were sort of over, you know, over a barrel in some senses, you know, but they had no choice but to take that advice. Um, fast forward, recently I was working in Hong Kong, um, so this is a few years ago, providing advice to the Hong Kong government around um, major health finance reforms. I mean, very similar to the concept with the Obamacare reforms that were going on. So um, how to provide sort of health insurance, um, you know, have the structure of health insurance system that actually works for everyone, not just um, had the you know sort of elite or the or the um, you know well-employed workforce and um, you know very good science like fantastic science people they they paid to get the you know the the analytics done but at the end of the day um, at that time um, the Hong Kong government was battling this pressure from China like China was looking like it was you know, really having a lot more influence on um, the country than they wanted to. So regulating the private sector, which is what they needed to do to get this health um, financing system to work better, just wasn't on the table. So, you know, it's about, you know, working with the situation you've got and taking the opportunities as they come. To give you another um, example, I was in um, Rwanda recently and had the opportunity to meet the Minister of Health there. And our, our country manager had for many years been trying to work with the government there to get eye health um, in their performance-based financing system. So um, trying very hard to, to, to if, if you can get you know, something, some key um, health item into that performance-based financing system, it means all the hospitals in the country um, will get a bonus if they provide those services. So it's a real focus for hospital managers. Um, and um, they had been, our country manager had been trying to influence for some time to get um, eye health on there. So I went um, to meet the minister about a number of things. Um, and I came in, my job title at the time was Global League Development Effectiveness. And she just saw this person coming in from Sydney and went, oh my goodness me, that, they're gonna take, she's gonna take money away. That's her, <laughs> that's her job is to take money away. And in a five minute conversation, something that, that, that the country manager had been doing, trying to do for several years was done. <laughs> so, so it's about using the opportunities, um, you know, to, to, um, to their best effect. Um, so I think um, I would encourage you to, to, to think about the science is one part of the story, um, but there is a lot more to actually advocating for change. Your comment around um, having a groundswell of community support is absolutely critical. If you look at the way the National Disability Insurance System came about, the NDIS came about in Australia, it was a very, very orchestrated campaign. Um, it was actually Bill Shorten who came into um, the disability groups um, some years ago, almost 10 years ago, I think, um, and basically said, you know, if you want to get real change in disability, you guys have got to come together, you've got to have a single clear message, you've got to have the science behind it, absolutely, but you need a campaign so that every Australian knows that this is important and why it matters. And so, you know, while the evidence is <coughs> critical to deciding what's the most important thing to do, the actual approach of getting that policy change can be very long term and requires a whole bunch of different people. So um, I guess what I'm saying is sharing some practical war stories um, and, and to think about how you engage. Yeah, get that evidence right, absolutely. How do you engage all the decision makers and the influencers um, to actually get your change? Yeah.